Today we're going to talk about Mr. Al-Khalili and his version of electricity. What do we know about electricity? Well, <laughs> we'll let uh, Mr. Al-Khalili tell us what he knows about electricity. Okay. Well, he starts with a little bit of history of, of um, electricity. He starts with this fellow, covered him in the past. His name was Francis Hawksby. He was uh, Newton's right-hand man, and he was the guy who did the experiments for Newton, essentially, after um, uh, Robert uh, Hooke died. So uh, that's when Newton took over the Royal Society and brought this man in to do his experiments. This fellow was more or less like the Faraday of his day. He, he was the guy who was in the lab doing the work. And he came up with this little invention, uh, Hawksby machine, uh, that produced a bluish glow when he rubbed it. You know, it was static electricity. The issue here is that, um, you know, uh, he was British, and that's, I guess, why uh, Al-Khalidi brings him up. Uh, he could have started a little earlier with this fellow, uh, I think was probably a little more important, uh, and that was uh, Otto von Guericke in Germany, and he's he did the same trick, but he did it with a... Um, a, um, a different material, a ball made out of a different material. It's uh, Hawksby who comes in there and does it with glass, okay? But anyways, uh, that's a brief uh, introduction that um, Al-Khalidi does. Then he moves into what was quite famous in the uh, 18th century, which was this Leiden jar, okay? I covered that in the past. And uh, essentially, all these people were charging this the glass ball, which Hawksby had come up with. And they were doing all kinds of tricks, trying to figure out what electricity was. And that moved along throughout the 18th century. Uh, you have uh, all the way to Ben Franklin, which a lot of people have heard of, especially in the States, uh, flying a kite and uh, doing his little uh, experiment with a... With a, um, with a key, supposedly. Uh, some people say he never did the experiments. Others say he did. Uh, it's not very clear. But uh, things really get rolling um, in the 18th century when uh, we have a fight between these two fellows. Um, uh, Mr. Galvani and Alessandro Volta. And you could say that it was... Uh, a spaghetti war. <laughs> uh, Galvani had discovered that uh, frogs, when he put a little uh, electricity through their legs, they they moved their leg. And uh, at first, uh, Volta, who was a physicist, supposedly a physicist, um, he, he liked the idea, but then he later on said, no, no, look, the reason he moves the uh, legs is he's just a conductor. Uh, it's the uh, plates that that you have at the ends that are producing the, uh, the electricity. And uh, so, yeah, they, they went back and forth and uh, Volta eventually invented what is known as the pile. And you can see why it's called a pile. It was a pile of metal there with uh, divisions there. And it, essentially that was the first battery. Okay, so Volta comes up with a battery. He's been uh, honored by uh, using his name for the name Volt. For, for the uh, uh, value known as volt in mathematics. And, um, and yeah, uh, all these people were uh, playing around with, um, with electricity or what they did not know about electricity was static electricity until things got a little more uh, involved and you get all the way to Davy who is the uh, uh, person who, who um, is going to produce the first arc. In other words, he's going to take two um, uh, poles and he's got it tied to gazillions of batteries <laughs> and he produces an arc right there in space. So uh, an arc light. In other words, he it was a very shiny light. And they said, well, it's great. It's a great magic trick, but what, what can we use it for? We can't light a house with that. It would make everybody blind. <laughs> so uh, that didn't uh, go very far, but it was a nice little trick. And they were doing essentially uh, tricks throughout the 18th century, what uh, were known as, Al-Khalili says, they were known as electricians. And electricians were essentially magicians. 
they would go there and do all kinds of tricks with your hair, you know, rub your hair and pull it up or pull some uh, feathers or whatever. And uh, they just had, they were just tricks. And of course, none of them had any idea how all that happened. Okay, so that's, that's the important, that's the scientific part. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Alkalidi then goes in there and says the following, he says, mid 18th century electrical philosophers, as, or electricians, right, were faced with this challenge. What electricity was, how it worked, and why it did all these things was nothing less than a complete mystery. So again, they had no clue whatsoever. The biggest surprise for Volta, right, was that the electricity it generated was continuous, okay? It poured out like water in a stream. Now listen to this. And just like a stream where the measure of the amount of water flowing is called a current, so the electricity flowing out of the pile, you know, that little pile that he made, became known as an electrical current. So this is where we get the notion that we have something flowing and this is going to be so bad for humanity because now we've had 200 years of this flowing stuff nobody knows what's flowing they say it's electrons but then they can't explain their atom so uh what is it that's flowing you know is it electron beads uh, individual discrete electron beads is, is that what what's flowing there tons of them and yeah that's what we have today but this is where it starts it starts with the notion that people use the analogy of the current, of stream current, of river currents to, to simulate or to think about electricity. They were thinking in those terms. Okay. So, um, Khalili continues. He says, uh, 200 years after Volta, we finally understand what electricity is. Do we? <laughs> I mean, do they, the, the mathematicians? We do, but do the mathematicians know what electricity is. The atoms in metals, like all atoms, have electrically charged electrons surrounding the nucleus. Oh, is that so? Uh, maybe they can draw an atom for me. Does it look like that thing there on the top uh, upper right? Is it an electron bead rolling around a uh, proton ball, bowling ball? Is that what it is? Is that uh, what an atom looks like? And the only question there again is, how is the electron B, that little thing that's going around, how is it tied to the nucleus? Why doesn't it spontaneously run off, you know, and, uh, and do ionization? Why does it stay physically bound to the nucleus? That's the only question any uh, theorist has to answer that proposes this model. And if they can't answer that question, they can't even start because what they're going to argue is that uh, electricity is going to be the flow of all these electron beads. And the question again is, what compels them to move? Are they hit with stones? Is that how the first one starts moving? Is that how the trickle starts? Do they get hit by something? So we've got two problems. The first one is that we cannot explain how the electron bead remains faithful to the, nu to the nucleus to begin with, and then what compels it to, to leave the nucleus? What is this force, this, this spirit that enables the electron to start its uh, journey? Okay, keep those two things in mind. Okay, uh, but in metals, the atoms share their outer electrons. Share? Uh, so I've got a little electron, the other guys have got a little electron, what do you mean we share? We, we exchange them, we, we put them on the same level, in what way do we share them? How do you share an electron? And again, what, what holds that electron bound to the nucleus to begin with? Okay, but all these issues come up because they're structural issues. What does an atom look like? That's going to be the issue. And, but he says it like, you know, it's a done deal, you know? And he said, but in metals, the atoms share their outer electrons with each other in a unique way, which means they can move from one atom to the next. So if they share, what's that got to do with moving from one atom to the next? Again, uh, there's a lot of stuff that he's bypassing. He's just rolling over here. Like, you know, we know it all, right? You know, but he hasn't explained anything. He's got to explain why 
the electron doesn't leave to begin with, then why does it share? What do you mean share? And then if they're sharing, like they're occupying some level out there, what compels them to start drifting and going, moving to, from atom to atom? All these questions are never answered. They talk about concepts, abstract sound, fields, forces. What are those? Charges. Those are not physical objects. And yeah, there you have the little picture of how they visualize these electron beads moving around the uh, metals. And the question is what compels all of them to start drifting in a single direction. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what is electricity? Well, he says, here it is. Uh, he puts on his caricature hat now and he says, if those electrons move in the same direction at the same time, the cumulative effect is a movement of electric charge. Charge? Charge moves? What is a charge? I thought charge was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And that's a value. That's a number. That's a amount. That's, that's not a thing. That's not a thing I can hold. So how can I have a movement of charge? Are they talking about, is it electrons that are moving? Or is it that they're measuring this charge flowing with some meter and they're saying, oh, the flow of charges. So, so they're cutting a lot of corners here because they go from objects all the way to concepts, to mathematical concepts. They start by saying, look, this is the electron. What is an electron? It's a charge. What's a charge? Oh, we don't know, but it's what well, we measure it. <laughs> and it's measured at 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And when we have lots of those, well, we have a flow of charges. We call that electricity or current or whatever. This flow of electrons is what we call an electric current. Okay, so now you know what an electric current is. It's a flow of charges. It's all these concepts, these mathematical concepts that are flowing. Well, you know, uh, the uh, 19th century, you had people like Faraday and, uh, and um, uh, Maxwell, and they became famous in that century. Why? Because they were able to play around um, uh, Faraday with experiments and, and Maxwell with mathematics. But it was a, a world in which people didn't really care about electricity. What was electricity? Nobody cared. People <laughs> wanted to make money, just like today. Most people don't care about what is electricity. What, is, what does an atom look like? People don't care about these things. They, they, the majority of people out there, 90% of, of humanity doesn't care about these things. They care about making money. They care about everyday stuff like going to work, making money, see if they can get rich, win the lottery. You know, they have other things on their mind, girls, you know, but uh, they never think in terms of, you know, uh, oh, what is electricity? How does it flow? Uh, what does an atom look like? They never ask these questions. Or they very seldom just, you know, touch these subjects. And yeah, and so uh, they make a comment here. Uh, Al Khalili makes a comment. He says, look, uh, uh, while Faraday continued uh, his work trying to understand the very nature of electricity, inventors from across Europe were less interested in the science and more interested in how electricity could make them money. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And, uh, we haven't changed a bit in 100, 200, 300, 400 years. Uh, people are not interested in these subjects, so they, they want to make money. They want to say, what's it good for? Tell me what I can use it for. What can I invent? What, what, I can, what can I sell? So they don't ask the fundamental questions like what is and why does it do this? Why does it behave this way? In other words, cause, mechanisms, right? What's certainly quite remarkable from a contemporary perspective is that by and large, nobody seems to really care very much what electricity is, right? He's talking about today, right? You don't have great theoretical debates as to whether it's a force or a fluid or a principle or a power. What they're really interested in is what electricity can do. Don't ask what you can do for electricity. Ask what electricity can do for your pockets. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's what uh, science has become. In other words, people are not interested in the subject matter, and therefore you can tell them whatever you want. You can tell them that... Uh, Electricity is the flow of angels. And as long as you have, uh, you know, a PhD uh, in uh, math, you, you can convince us, hey, you know, that's, that's what we've proven. We've proven it with experiments. Here's the equation. What's the guy going to do? Challenge you? He says, oh, well, you know, you know more than me. <laughs> you know, so uh, you can sell people who are not interested, who are very apathetic 
to these things. You can sell them anything. And, and that's where we are today. They're selling them a lot of stuff like, you know, electron flows and charge flows and so on. Okay, uh, but that uh, brings two fellows who uh, were making money or trying to make money. And it's these two gentlemen, they worked with electricity, not so much with electricity, they weren't interested in, again, in the science. Uh, they were just uh, doing things every day to try to figure out how they could make money. They were businessmen. They were not inventors and they were not um, scientists, okay? So we have, you know, especially Edison, we have him as a god. You say, oh, Edison, you know, the wizard of Menlo Park, you know, that's where he had his company. And, you know, he was an, even an inventor. He was just a business, a good businessman, no doubt about that. You want to, you know, have him as an icon for business, that's fine. But he, he, what is an inventor? An inventor is a guy who sits down and thinks and tries to figure out you know, a new machine or a new device or a new way of making, of doing something or making something. And Edison, was, you know, he started out like that. Later on, he abandoned that. He, he was more into business. He was trying to make contracts and so on. And uh, he made a contract with this fellow, with Joseph Swan, in fact. They created a little company. And uh, why? Because Swan had a few patents and Edison wanted access to those patents. He had some other patents. And so, uh, you know, they, it was the hunger and the, uh, um, and the uh, um, eagerness to eat <laughs> that got together that, uh, on, you know, with these two fellows. And what they did was they formed a company and they put their patents together. Okay. And that's what they did. They started to make money. And yeah, uh, you know, you look at uh, where uh, Thomas Edison was born. He was born in 1847. He was only three years old when Swan began working on the light bulb. So, uh, you know, Swan had a, quite a bit of a head start over Edison in many ways. So they say, you know, uh, Edison's the inventor of the light bulb. In that sense, Al-Khalili is right. You know, uh, Edison is just a moneymaker. That's all he was. He was not a scientist for sure. He did, never knew anything about electricity. Um, he, he just tried different things, especially to come up with his filament, and he tried one material after another. Does that make him even a hero? No, it's, it's just the fact that he was at the right place at the right time. He had the right tools that you can give him credit for. You know, the fact that he was lucky. He was where he was supposed to be. He built this empire. Fine. But that's got little to do with him being an inventor himself. Okay. In fact, he had uh, on board uh, this other fellow who was um, Tesla, who worked a while with him, then went to work for the competition. <laughs> okay, so um, so uh, what did these guys do? All these people worked on making money. You know, th this is what they did. They they all uh, worried about making money. That that's what that's what their goal was. That's what they had in their mind. Okay. So uh, both, um, both these fellows, they formed uh, this company, which was known as Ediswan uh, by a lot of people. I don't think that was the official name. In what were considered to be independent lines of inquiry, Swan's incandescent electric lamp was developed at the same time uh, as Thomas Edison was working on his incandescent lamp with Swan's first successful lamp and Edison's lamp, both patented in 1879. That's how old these lamps were, okay? And they were attempting to replace the heating lamps, right? Edison's goal in developing his lamp, his lamp was for it to be used as one part of a much larger system, a long-life, high-resistance lamp that could be connected in parallel to work economically with a large-scale electric lighting utility he was creating. He was trying to sell a utility, not so much lamps. He was trying to sell both, really. Swan's strong patents in Great Britain led in 1883... Uh, sorry, Swan's original lamp design with its low resistance, the lamp could only be used in series and short lifespan was not suited for such an application. So Swan's strong patents in Great Britain led in 1883 to the two competing companies merging to exploit both Swan's and Edison's inventions with the establishment of the Edison Swan United Electric Light Company, known commonly as Ediswan. Uh, the company sold lamps made with uh, cellulose uh, filament that Swan had invented in 1881, while Edison uh, company continued using bamboo filaments outside of Britain. 
1892, General Electric, which was what this company became, right, began exploiting Swan's patents to produce cellulose uh, filaments until they were replaced in 1904. Okay, so these guys were businessmen. Uh, in fact, if they would have known a little bit about electricity, instead about doing business, uh, you know, signing contracts and that sort of thing, lobbying, uh, what they would have done is they go out there and study materials like semiconductors, etc., and they would have probably made a lot more progress. They were interested in making money. So, uh, in science, they're not heroes, okay? Uh, but then uh, were other people heroes like Tesla, which is... You know, here Tesla is a guy who's glorified by the electric universe and by the flat earthers and all these uh, locos out there. <laughs> all these people care about the uh, good old Tesla. And what happened, you know, Tesla was, um, was used to work for Edison. Then he went to work for the competition for uh, George um, Westinghouse, whereas um, uh, Edison was uh, banked by uh, J.P. Morgan. So here were two rich guys behind these two uh, corporations, really, uh, or, or uh, entrepreneurs. And, uh, and one of the big wars that Alkali talks about is the fact that, you know, it's known as the current war or the war of the currents. Uh, uh, um, Edison liked uh, direct current because that's what he was up to. And Tesla had come up with alternating current. And eventually Tesla won. He won a big contract uh, to get power out of the Niagara Falls. And because of that, you know, he, uh, uh, Westinghouse did pretty good. Uh, you know, they were able to impose alternating current. By that time, you know, Alva Edison had also branched off into other uh, devices, the phonograph and so on, you know. So, so he had uh, several products. His company had grown by then. So it was a bit of a loss, but not a fatal loss under no circumstance. In fact, it was the other way around. The guy who's going to be left out would be Tesla. Okay, Yeah, and Tesla was not a scientist. Neither was just like Alva Edison wasn't a scientist. Uh, Tesla just tried one thing after another. Did he have an explanation for what he was doing, for what electricity was, how it operated? No. He was using the same atom as everybody else. And if anything, uh, uh, he worked with waves, you know, that he didn't understand. He talked about fields and energy. So obviously he, he had no clue whatsoever about science. And that's what the words that were used in those days, and they're even used today. So nothing has changed. So Tesla could not have been a scientist, okay? Was he an inventor? Well, if you call an inventor a, a guy who imagines and invents something comes up with a new idea yeah he, in that sense he could be an inventor another thing is what alba edison did which was just try one thing after another mechanically until you figure it out you know anybody can do a lot of this by trial and error you know you you take a magnet you pick up pins and then you say well what if i want a stronger magnet so you try a stronger magnet and you say oh this one has a different uh behavior and then you use that for some purpose that's what all these people did. Is that an inventor or is that just a guy who goes in there, is in the lab and just tries one thing after another and ideas come to his mind? You know, nice to be in an island and uh, not have anything at your disposal and just visualize and, and then come up with things. Now that would be an inventor in my opinion. But a guy who goes to the lab because he's got a job because that is his job, his livelihood, and he goes in and tries different things and discovers things while he's doing things like Faraday did. You know, I don't call those inventors, really. Yeah, they came up with inventions because it's what research and development uh, sectors do today. They go out there, they have all these people, they work in different things, and they come up with a new idea. Uh, who's the inventor? The team. <laughs> Why? Because this guy pitches in something, the other guy pitches something else. And that's more or less how these people worked as well. You know, they saw something, they, uh, they were bright people, uh, no, not taking that away from them, but it, that's not the same thing as just being isolated and visualizing, okay? Now, Tesla did a little bit of that. He did visualize things and then try to put them into practice, okay? In that sense, he was an inventor. But if he just went into the lab and tried different things and then came up with something like Alva Edison did, well, then he's not an inventor. 
So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the jury's still out with Tesla. I don't know if he was an inventor or not. Certainly, he was not a scientist. Scientist is a guy who can explain, not a guy who can come up with a device or can say, oh, wondrous lies like this charlatan did all the time, promising so many inventions to the world and supposedly died with them. And everybody saying, oh, the FBI went in and took all his secrets. <laughs> Poor old Tesla. Yeah, he has, I think he died penniless. Uh, he was found in a hotel room after three days of being dead. Okay, um, let's move on here. You organize myself here a little bit. Got so many of these little things. Okay, um, so here um, Al Khalili continues, and he says, In the 1880s, people were terrified by electricity. Yeah, they had heard that people could get shocked and so on. It could shock and even kill in an instant, and the reasons why weren't fully um, understood. So people had no idea yet what electricity was. They were able to de develop devices. They had the telegraph by then. Okay, They had all these nice little toys. The, the uh, telephone was in those days also in the process of uh, being spread around. And uh, we had these little toys out there, but nobody knew how they worked. In other words, no one understood electricity. Okay, and, and this is the key because that's the science part. The rest is all technology. And I guess you know where I'm going with all this. <laughs> yeah, technology and science never shall meet. They're two different things, completely different. Okay. Um, so how does uh, Al-Khalili continue? Well, he says, after centuries of man's experiments with electricity, a new age of real understanding was now dawning. Was it? <laughs> understanding? Like, you know, uh, not description, but explanation. Uh, you know, we're not talking about being able to describe and uh, put an equation, you know, uh, describe it mathematically. We're talking about, can you explain? Okay. Surrounding any electric charge is a force field. What the hell is a force field? Is it? Uh, I, I think I've got one here. Give me a second. If I can get it up here. Um, is that the force field? <laughs> We've got it today. The force may the force go with you. You know. Michael Faraday had proposed a theory that says that a flow of electricity could in some way create an invisible force field, whatever that was, okay? I guess it's the, what comes out of the uh, swords there. Is that what a force field is? Uh, that's what happens when you invent concepts and you do not really know what you're talking about. So you invent these abstract concepts, mathematical concepts primarily, but it could be qualitative ones as well. And they're concepts, You're, and people treat them like objects. So they say uh, an invisible force field. Hopefully, all fields are invisible because they're concepts. We can't see any concept as far as I'm concerned. James Maxwell proved Faraday correct. Correct? Uh, proved? You see how they use these words. It's like a done deal. You have to accept it. you got to memorize it because it's, it's already been proven, and it's correct. It's true. And uh, so what did they prove? That there's a force field? That there's a concept? That there's an invisible concept? Yeah. <laughs> I guess he proved that much. Okay. Not through experimentation, but through mathematics. Maxwell's calculations showed how these fields could be disturbed. How can you disturb a concept? How do you disturb love? How do you disturb information? What do you do? You shake it around? So, so again, these people are using objects as concepts, and that's what pervaded the language. We've had this language at least for 100 years, if not more. And that's, that's been the bane of, uh, of science. Okay? Changing the direction of electric current, you could create a ripple or wave. A wave? What's a wave? Through these electric and magnetic fields. So now we have a wave in fields. I mean, it's like saying, uh, you know, are we talking about wheat fields, corn fields? If there's a wave, like the wind comes over, moves the corn field, you know, the, the corns, each one of the stalks, and we see it from afar, say, okay, there's a wavy motion 
But what's the object? The object are the corn, the, 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 the stalks. Those are the object. What's the object here? It's the waving of fields. <laughs> what's a field when a field is a bunch of numbers around an object? It's a value at each point in space. That's what a field is. Now they're moving, they're moving all these concepts. They're waving the concepts. And it says waves that would carry energy. How do you carry energy? Like on your back? You can see none of this is an explanation. It's all gobbledygook uh, language. Uh, they're, they're moving love around. They're moving grace, hatred. You know, that's what they're moving around. And they're saying, oh, we have the vibration of energy or the uh, carrying of energy. How do you carry energy? Until something absorbed them, you're going to absorb energy, okay? Waves could spread through these fields like ripples on a pond. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, the, the magic show just started. <laughs> they started moving all these things. Okay, and one of the fellows who made it kind of visible was this fellow, uh, Hertz, you know. And Hertz designed an experiments to prove that Maxwell waves really existed. Here we have Maxwell proving Faraday. Now we have Hertz proving Maxwell, okay? Hertz built a device that could actually create and detect these waves as they pass through the air. You could, you could detect them. Uh, I mean, uh, create and, and detect waves. What are you detecting? I mean, what you have to detect is the object, not the wave. It's like saying, I detected the ocean wave. Yeah, but what, what's causing the, the wave is the water. So you have to refer to the water always. You can't just continue talking about the wave as if the wave were an object. Wave is a verb. Wave is what the ocean water does. Ocean water is the physical object, the, the one made out of atoms, etc. Wave is what it does. Wave is a verb. Wave is an action, a phenomenon. You can't say, you can't use it as a uh, noun as he's using it in every single sentence here. He had detected Maxwell's waves traveling through space. And more nonsense. Through space, space is nothing. How do you travel through nothing? I mean, you can travel through something. You can travel through molasses, water, air. Or if, if you're Superman or whatever, the Flash, you can maybe travel through iron. I don't know. Uh, but these guys are traveling through space, through concepts, through nothing. And uh, they have these waves traveling through nothing. So we have wave, which is a concept, it's traveling through nothing. You figured it out. <laughs> After centuries of man's experiments with electricity, a new age of understanding was really dawning. Yet Oliver Lodge exclaimed, okay, we have enslaved that all-pervading ether. So here... Uh, they said we, we have a new dawn of a new dawning of understanding, and this guy is talking about the ether. And so you, you know, and uh, a couple of years later, or around the same time, 1881, I think it was, uh, to 1887, Michelson and Morley showed to the world, at least to the mathematical community, that there is no such thing as the ether. And so this guy, I don't know, he's talking about the ether. You figure it out. So was it an understanding, or was it that they thought they understood. This is, this is the question you should ask. Did these guys really understand? And here's the ether, okay? Bunch of particles. And what are they saying? Is that a wave, the waving of the ether? Are the particles shaking up and down? Is that what's happening? Is that what a wave is? Okay, so yeah, it's uh, all these deranged uh, people from the electric universe and uh, flat earthers and me quantum mechanics. They talk about waves and particles because uh, they never have to explain what moves the particle up and what moves it down. Why does it wave? Why does it oscillate? That's what you got to explain. You got to explain the cause, the mechanism. And to say it does so, well, yeah, <laughs> if it's a particle. If it's not a particle, maybe it does not so. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, so, so he went a, a, a step further and he said, could the electric current pass through nothingness, through the vacuum? Good question. How can you pass through nothing? You can pass through something, but it's very hard to pass through nothing. You can't cut across nothing. You're not occupying locations in nothingness. You can only occupy locations with respect to other objects, atoms, for example. Okay? 
then you can say this atom has a location with respect to the, all the other atoms in the universe. Then you can talk about location because you're talking, the reference is all the rest of the atoms in the universe. So you have a distance with respect to each one of those. Then you can talk about location. This guy's talking about going through nothing. Like if it's a little ball, the only ball in the universe, right? It's the only object and it's going traversing. It's cutting across nothing. <laughs> With the Crookes tube, uh, could finally see electricity. The CRT was born. Yeah, the Crookes tube was essentially what was going to become the CRT, the cathode ray tube. Okay, and did we understand it? Well, they uh, gave it an explanation, and which lasts to this day. Okay, and the question is whether that explanation is correct, whether the mechanism that these people are talking about is correct. And here it is: the electrons only moved in one direction. Electrons, how did they come out of the atom? How were they stuck to the atom to begin with? Why didn't they spontaneously come out? Why did they need something to push them? If that's what happened, I mean, what compelled them to move? From the heated and metal plate through the positively charged metal plate at the other end, we discovered how to manipulate electrons flowing through the vacuum. That's the quantum mechanical version. That's where he gets this. You have just electrons flowing through the vacuum, okay? Let me put a comparison there so you can see what the difference is and where the problem is with this. Here's classical electricity, okay? Here you have atoms, and what the electrons do is they move from atom to atom. That's different than what quantum and alkalili say, which is just electrons moving through the vacuum, no atoms there, okay? And of course, we have our rope model, okay? And that's, you know, just a twirling of electron shells, which are all merged in a single row, okay? Now, what happens? If you pump the vacuum chamber down and you go beyond minus 7 tor, you're not going to get electricity. You're not even going to get an arcing after a while, okay? So if you keep pumping down, like, to the moon level, to the minus 12 tor level, you will not get an arc, uh, that already destroys the religion of uh, the electric universe. The electric universe is talking about plasma electricity out there in space because they have to explain gravity, right? That's how they explain it. And where's the plasma? <laughs> I mean, they know or they accept, uh, as far as I know, all uh, electric universers, they concede, okay, that man went to the moon. Some people don't, but as far as I'm concerned, officially the electric universe says, yeah, man went to the moon. They even have shots of Mercury and uh, the moon, which they take from NASA and they put on their website. That means they agree that humans have gone out into outer space, unlike the flat earthers who say, you know, these guys never went there. Okay, so there, there's a difference there. Okay, so man went through the moon, uh, Apollo 14, Apollo 15, they put a uh, cold cathode up there and they measured the vacuum on the surface of the moon. There was one probe also that measured uh, the vacuum in empty space as it was traveling between somewhere between the Earth and the moon. Also, both those readings came out in the minus 11 and minus 12 Tor range. You cannot produce electricity with such low vacuum. Electric universe people need to understand the ABCs, <laughs> okay? So it's, it's just totally nonsense what the electric universe proposes, that uh, gravity is electricity. Okay? It's absolute nonsense. No, no chance whatsoever in science, by the way. Okay, okay um, so what does al Khalili conclude? Because, I mean, you would think that he's something better than the electric universe. No, he ain't. Uh, he's uh, partly because the uh, electric universe uh, takes its cues from quantum mechanics. Okay? They, they use the same atom. That's the problem. And uh, so, again, there's your atom. Uh, please explain why that electron bead doesn't fly away. What keeps it bound to the proton? Why does it jump? What causes it to jump inwards and jump outwards? And they say loss of energy. Energy is a concept. What did it lose? Did it lose uh, three pounds of iron or something, and that's why it's lighter, not fell inwards? What did it lose? What did it gain when it gains energy and jumps to a higher uh, energy level? What the hell are they talking about? What are these energy levels? Are they balls? Are they uh, spheres, uh, membranes that encapsulate the proton? 
or are they just regions, concepts, where we can find the electron bead? Those are the issues that need to be resolved before anyone has a theory. Okay? You can't talk about a theory about electricity or about ionization until you tell me what your atom looks like. And if that's your atom, you got a lot more questions because how does that electron stay bound to the proton, to the nucleus? And if you can't answer that question, you can't even start your presentation. The microphone is withdrawn. <laughs> Alkalini said, it was in the early 20th century that we finally discovered what atoms were made up of and how they behaved. Did we? Did they? <laughs> uh, he's talking about Rutherford, essentially, right? And so what electricity actually was at the atomic scale? I don't think they know what electricity is at any scale. They use it. They can, they can work with it like we can work with magnets. That doesn't mean that he understands what a magnetic field is. And likewise, he doesn't understand what electricity is. He thinks it's a flow of electric beads. And then all he's got to answer is that atom. We take them back to the atom. Anyone, anyone who uses that atom to do its electricity or your ionization or whatever magnetism, we take you back to the atom. What does your atom look like? Please draw your atom. If you tell me you don't know, you can't start. Because we don't care about Mother Nature's real, genuine, super duper, honest to goodness atom. We care about your atom in order to understand your theory. So you have to draw your atom and defend it. You have to defend it against Bill Gates' attacks. <laughs> okay, I'm going to attack that atom. I'm not going to let you do your presentation with that atom. So if you do electric universe stuff with that atom, you do uh, flat earth with that, you do quantum mechanics with that, I'm going to attack your, your stupid atom. That atom doesn't work. Okay? You, can't ex you can't justify it. And you can't justify it with concepts saying, well, you have this field and we have the charge. Now, tell me what physical object is between the proton and the electron. That's all you got to do. You got to draw something in there. Okay? And yet the explanation today is, uh, okay, advances in radar technology during World War II led us to tinker with semiconductors and gradually phased out valves, okay? Uh, we, we started with valves, which was a modification of the CRT of Crookes tube, and then we moved on to semiconductors. And yet the explanation today is that photons are knocking electrons out of the atoms, despite that no one can illustrate an atom or explain how the electron bead physically remains bound to the nucleus. That's my statement there, before it is ex, 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 excited, sorry, excited out of the uh, nucleus, or out of its orbit. So that's what a person has to answer. What keeps it bound to the proton? What excites it and takes it out of the atom so that the atom is ionized and now you have a flow of electrons? And if you have a flow of electrons, what keeps them moving? What keeps them flowing in one direction? Is, are they being pushed? are being sucked from the front, you know, like a vacuum cleaner. You got to explain the mechanism. You can't just say, well, they flow. That's a description. I need a mechanism. And of course, uh, for a mechanism, you're going to have to start at the atom. So good luck with that one. Uh, uh, I, I like uh, Bohr and Heisenberg, which I mentioned the other day. They said you cannot even imagine. So don't even try to imagine or visualize the atom, the quantum atom. So anyone who tries, like Bohr said, is an idiot. He called Feynman an idiot because he tried to convince the crowd that, yeah, yeah, you, you can visualize this. Look, listen to me a second. No, no, Bohr said, I'm not going to listen to you, idiot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you cannot visualize the quantum atom. It's the uh, bead, uh, the, the particle atom that you cannot visualize because you cannot explain anything with that atom. So if that's your atom and that's the one you learned by rote in high school or college, you're going to be in trouble in this site. Okay, in this site, you're going to be in definite trouble. So you better forget that atom. Okay, uh, we have a different atom, as you all know. Okay, anyways, uh, here's my summary, my conclusions of uh, good old Al Khalili. Uh, he does a good job in reciting, you know. Uh, historian, right? No problem there. The history of experiments that led to the discovery and description of the electricity. Description. That's all they did. They described and they described uh, the invisible stuff uh, completely in, in an irrational way. They described it with little balls and their math described also the little balls. So it was always a little ball world. 
and little balls can only push. You can't pull with balls, with discrete balls. And that's what separates it from the rope model. The rope model, for the first time in history, introduces pull, the force of pull. There's never been a force of pull. They always did it in a Ptolemaic way. You know, they did it through push. <laughs> push gravity, like a couple people out there. What was a Van Flandern was one of them, Tom Van Flandern push gravity. To this day, the mathematicians and experimentals have no clue what electricity is. They don't. They have no idea. They, they use it, and they consider that now classical mechanics, and nobody deals with that. Everybody's into quantum and string theory and uh, relativity. Nobody deals with this stuff anymore. So they learn whatever they learn in high school, and then they forget about it all completely. They say, oh, that's classical mechanics. It's got no future. So nobody knows what electricity is because everybody just learns by rote whatever they learned up to high school, and then they just repeat it from then on. Nobody ever decided to question whether uh, the uh, particle model of the atom and of electricity uh, have any validity or are even possible. And here, you're, here are people like Bohr and Heisenberg who study in great detail all this stuff. They tell you, look, you cannot picture the atom. We cannot explain it with this atom. So quantum mechanics is based on, a, on, a, on an object called the atom, which no one can illustrate for you because whenever they do it, they can't use that atom to explain anything. And if they say, well, we can explain ionization, we can explain electricity, <laughs> you take them back to the atom, you say, what keeps the bead bound to the nucleus to begin with? What compels it to move? And we're back to square one. Quantum cannot explain those except through descriptive... Um, uh, words. In other words, they use uh, the words of mathematics, field, wave, you know, particle, zero dimensional point particles, right? So they use all these nebulous terms to get their theory across. But when you put them to the test, you, what's a field? Well, it's a bunch of numbers. What's a charge? Well, it's a number. It's uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And, and all you get is all these abstract mathematical concepts. That's what they're moving. That's the, where the problem is. We don't have a mechanism. Uh, alkali, uh, alkali, alkali, uh, alkali <laughs> actually proves that experiments in math cannot tell you what an atom looks like or how Mother Nature does electricity. That's my conclusion. Uh, questions should be addressed in that direction, okay?